Let me tell you why you're here. I've seen things. Oh my god. Whoa, yeah! You don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Guaranteed to jack you up. Yo, what is going on, my dudes? It's your host, Lamar Stays Weird, coming to you once again, out of sight, out of mind, with another podcast. And I want to start off by saying I am so sorry that I've been MIA for a while. It started off with me being sick, and I was, like, bedridden. I, I had to keep myself in my office room, separated from everyone else for, like, a week, uh, a little over a week. Then I finally got better. And then I just had family coming in. I had other stuff. So it's like, it just kept getting set back. I did record a podcast. I just didn't like how it was. And I, I was editing it. I, I would say I was halfway done editing it. And it takes so long to fucking edit and make a podcast. And I just, I wasn't feeling it. So I was like, you know what? This, this isn't it for me. I, I'll do a new one. I'll do a different movie. And the movie I was doing on, I did like. Don't don't get me wrong. I love the movie. It just, I, I guess, just being sick and all that other stuff, I just couldn't muster up. Uh, I, I just didn't like what I was doing. And it gets that way whenever you're being creative about something. You can easily just not like something anymore. And that's what was happening with me. So uh, if you guys deal with that, I'm sorry. I know it's such a terrible funk to be in. But and this is completely unrelated to... Um, I guess what I do here on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, all that stuff. I have been getting a lot of writing done. I've been world building on my comic that I've been working on for like five years. It's changed drastically from what it used to be. So now it's like so different now from what it was. And I've been watching shows, watching movies, getting inspiration, listening to albums. And I, I think I'm getting closer. I think I can almost start writing sometime soon I, I don't know when but maybe sometime this year i can actually start writing and i'd be really thrilled about that but uh that time that i had away from this i was actually able to pretty much develop like three comics that are all within the same world so i'm super excited so much going on in my mind it's insane but i i wanted to do a podcast and i was like you know what this movie came to mind and i really really wanted to watch it and I don't have it on physical media and it's not really streaming anywhere on the services I have. So I had to start a free trial and, and to where I could watch the movie and I could talk about it today. I just finished it, but I've watched it so many times. I love the movie. It's great. In case you can't tell by the title and my shirt today, we are going to be talking about 2016's green room. Now I love this movie. This movie is dark it is gruesome it is insane but i love this movie and, and and don't think i'm like boosting it up or anything no the movie is genuinely that fucking good man it's super contained in this one building and it works perfectly it knows exactly what it's doing not a shocker to anyone this is an a24 production movie so i think this was my first a I think this was my first A24 uh, movie that I've ever seen. At least in memory, it's the only one I can really think of. But if you never heard of it, please check it out. Especially if you're into like the hardcore scene, like music and uh, all that stuff. You're into all that. And of course, if you like horror, you know, suspenseful like shit going on, this movie's right up your alley. It's right up your fucking crack, man. It is such a good movie. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Creeperama. Look how amazing this shirt is, man. From the fucking tie-dye effects. And I'm sorry if you guys can't see it over there on... Uh, you guys see my Star Wars pajamas. But I'm sorry if you guys can't see it. You know, but just... Uh, if you could check out the video, check it out. Just for this shirt alone. This is so fucking cool, man. It's honestly one of my favorite, like, collaboration shirts that I've seen. This is... Bro, this is such an awesome shirt. And I think it looks good on me, like... Oh, check out these guns, bro. I mean, I don't really have any, but like, I feel like I do the way the shirt fits. <laughs> no, nah, I'm severely out of shape. Don't even worry about it. And the cast in this movie really blows my mind. We have like some Trekkies in this movie and I really dig it. We have Anton Yelchin, who's played Chekhov in the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies. And he's a phenomenal actor. He's been quite a few other things. Odd Thomas, Charlie Bartlett, 
alongside with Robert Downey Jr. That was a really good movie. Uh, 2011's Fright Night remake and quite a few other movies. He, he's a phenomenal actor. Rest in peace to him. He died a completely horrible death at a very young age and i feel really bad like it's honestly weird he was a very talented kid and i'm i'm 27 now and he died at 27 he's part of the 27 club it is such a fucking shame like you know i, I don't know if you guys want to be traumatized at all but i'm pretty sure you could look up details of his death i don't want to talk about it on here but it's an unfortunate set of events it's some final destination shit and uh, he didn't have to go out that way, man. It's it's terrible. You know, much respect to him, his craft. Yeah, I think I think he would have been incredible, uh, doing incredible things. He he's such a great actor, and it's a good thing we at least have a catalog of some sort of his films. And I don't mean to be on a sour subject again, but this was Anton Yelchin's last theatrical released movie. He died a month later after it happened on June 19th, 2016. So really sad, but I I hope he was proud of the movie. He did phenomenal. And talking about Green Room's Anton Yelchin dying at 27, it, it just makes me think of all the other people in the 27 Club. The 27 Club is very, I guess you want to say infamous. I mean, I, I don't know. It's nothing but just very talented people who just weirdly enough passed away at 27 there's like a long list but here are just a few that i know of. you have Jimi hendrix one of the most legendary guitarists of all time i love Jimi hendrix i think he's a fucking god with the instrument he passed away on september 18th 1970 jim morrison from the doors july 3rd 1971 and of course everybody knows probably one of the most famous ones kurt cobain from nirvana april 5th 1994 Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones, July 3rd, 1969. Robert Johnson, legendary blues guitarist of all time, held as probably a very legendary guitarist. And of course, he helped establish what we know as the blues nowadays, which eventually became rock and roll. So one of the most influential people to ever grace holding a guitar. Any song that one creepy song that had like everybody super tense about the whole Illuminati thing and people selling their souls to the devil for talent and stuff. Crossroad Blues specifically talks about that. He died August 16th, 1938. And another one in kind of recent memory would be the unforgettable Amy Winehouse. She passed away July 23rd, 2011. It's super unfortunate that this is something that's happened and everybody knows about this club. And if you are 27 or about to be 27, yo, I hope you make it. I'm on the tail end of 27. I turned 28 later this year, July 31st. And it's... It's wild, man. It was one of the, I never thought I would live past 18 and here I am almost about to be 28 and it's like, fuck, am I even going to make it? Fuck. It's like, I don't know, man. I got a few more months to go, but if anything happens, I love you. I miss you. And I wish everybody the best. We're all just trying to have a good time out here, but we have him. And then we have Sir Patrick Stewart, fucking Picard, man. Professor X. He is, he just... He's this huge figure in geekdom, and I love it. And he's in this movie as the villain Darcy. And it trips me out because I've never seen him as a villain. And in here, he's he's cold, he's collected, he's very smart. Like, he just knows exactly what he's doing. Now, before I start gushing over this movie a bit too much, we're going to go ahead and go over quite a few of the facts. And then we're going to go into the summary. Then we go into the spoilery part where I'm talking about the whole movie and all that shenanigans. But yeah, this movie came out in May 13th, 2016. So if you have that as your birthday, you feel very fucking special about it. That is awesome. Let me know if you actually do have that as your birthday. That'd be insane. This movie sits at a 7 out of 10 on IMDb. I think that's pretty fair. You know, I mean, I, I think I enjoyed around there. I would probably say maybe like 7.5, 8. You know, I, that, that is me personally. Now, this movie didn't do too well at the box office, unfortunately, but it was made on a small budget of $5 million, and I think it only made like $3.7 million, so meh. So not great by any means, but I think it definitely deserves way more attention I love because it is a very well-done movie, and I'm glad it's on streaming services and so on, so that way people can actually watch it, and there's people like me who want to talk about it and support the film. I'm glad there's a company like Creeporama that loved it enough to make this amazing shirt now i get to have it it's awesome and the movie's not very long it doesn't take much out of your day it's only an hour and 35 minutes very well done and just in the first 20 minutes shit goes sideways and you have an hour and 15 minutes left of just fucking balls to the wall what the fuck 
going on in your head. Like if you imagine yourself in this situation, you'd probably be doing exactly what these people are doing or maybe even worse. Or maybe if you have some fucking John Wick training, maybe even better. It's about this struggling traveling punk band that is trying to go to a gig. Unfortunately, that gig falls through. So they meet with the same guy to get them another gig because he owes them. But unfortunately, the only gig he could get because of a connection was at a neo-Nazi bar. And if you know the first thing about punks, punks don't fucking like Nazis. It's not supposed to be, it's not a thing, but somehow like they really like punk music and all this other stuff. I don't know. Neo-Nazis are fucking weird. I don't know why they're a thing or whatever. If you're a neo-Nazi, go fuck yourself. Like, I, I don't know what to say other than that. Just go fuck yourself. Like, I, I don't know. So they go there, play a show, they witness a murder, and then everything just goes south from there. Now it's about these people trying to fight to get out and go back to the real world because shit has gone hardcore. And this movie is balls to the wall from like the 20 minutes that everything actually happens all the way to the end. It is super intense. It's gruesome. It's gritty. It's very boots to ground. It's gnarly. So please check it out if you guys haven't seen it. It is a great movie, great cast, awesome practical effects. It goes wild. And if you have seen it, I want to know what you think. And if you haven't, go do yourself a favor and go fucking watch it. Now, before we actually get into the movie, and I have to give Green Room credit for kind of bringing this to my attention. Every, everybody knows Nazis. Everybody knows neo-Nazis. Yeah, sure. But I never knew anything else really past like, okay, the stuff with history, you know, the wars and all that. Yeah, I know that. I never understood neo-Nazis. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I, I didn't know what the fuck they really were. But I just know I've seen them here in Florida a few times and it's fucking scary. It's wild. I don't know why it's a thing. It wasn't until this movie, and I thought this was really fucking cool, whenever you see the black boots with red laces. That shit goes hard, man. That shit looks awesome. Why the fuck did they have to have taste like that? Why does that look so good, but belongs to big pieces of shit? Like, like such wastes of space. Why do they gotta have just like a shred of style? Why? And the one little bit of style they get, it looks fucking awesome. And they ruin it for everyone because nobody can do that. You, you, you can't do that. And it sucks because it looks so fucking good. I love the color red. Clearly, I love the color red. And trust me, there's more red around here that you guys aren't seeing. But there were some awesome ass Doc Martens I've thought about getting. And another weird thing, because he was a fucking Nazi. I don't know if you Doc Martin lovers out there know that. He was a fucking Nazi. And they had a collab with one of my favorite movies of all time, Blade Runner. And those boots were gorgeous. Fucking gorgeous. I've never thought about that. I'm a Vans guy. I went from Converse back in my teen years to Vans. And they had an amazing collaboration. I'll have pictures up right now so you guys can see them. And I fucking love them. They looked great. Sold out, of course. Uh, of course, I can't fucking get my hands on them. But you know what? Those fucking boots will look amazing with some red laces. But you know who can't do it? Me. Especially being white presenting. I cannot wear boots with red. Not gonna happen. But man, fuck neo-Nazis, dude. That shit looks so fucking tight, and I hate that they own that. God damn it. Sorry to go on that little rant, but I feel so passionate about that because, man, it looks so good, and I hate that, man. So like I said in the little synopsis, we're following a band, Ain't Rights. Now that band consists of Tiger, Sam, Reese, and Pat. And a really cool fact is Anton Yelchin and Aaliyah Shawkat, they already had previous experience of playing with instruments. So it was up to the other two actors who played Tiger and Reese to learn how to play their instruments and be a full functioning punk band. That is fucking awesome. I love that that's a thing. So they're on their way to meet this guy called Tad. He was the one that set them up with this gig, but unfortunately it fell through because his previous show, I guess, got pretty rowdy and people throwing up, puking everywhere and all that other stuff. So they turned around and said, no, not, not taking any more of your people. So they drove 90 miles out of the way to go to this show. They're definitely struggling because they don't have money like that because it is very hard to make it as a traveling band. Often people don't realize being a band like that, you don't make much money until you sign or anything like that. But he said he could get another gig lined up and it is the most out of whack 
fucking place I've ever seen. But honestly, I would have loved it. I think it would have been really fucking cool. He gets this punk band to go play at a Mexican restaurant. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I would have loved some fucking tamales, carne asadas, burritos, and rice and beans, and enjoying a punk show. That's just me. I would have had a hell of a good time. Give me a fucking mojito at the same time. I'm fucking sold, man. I am in. Yeah, fuck yeah. That would have been sick, but obviously not a whole lot of people were feeling it, but there were some people sitting around and listening, and there was one dude recording on his phone, and Tiger, who's the singer of the group, told him, turn that shit off. And the guy just like, just like puts it down it's like oh okay because yeah they don't do any of that social media stuff he's not all about it they're all about the experience you have to go out of your way to find them be there enjoy it be in the moment and i love that i love that's how concerts used to be i remember a little bit before when i was going to warp tour back in the day and of course there were phones out and stuff but nowhere near to the extent that they are nowadays yeah, a lot of more people were having fun and now i'm one of those people that record some stuff here and there i just like to get a little bit Maybe get like a picture or two that looks really good. Maybe get a little minute snippet of a song I can put on Instagram for a little video. That's it. Phone down, rest of the show, paying attention, focus, loving it. That's what I do. You know, because I, I feel like I have short term memory. I am so worried. I'm just going to forget things. So I like making memories. I like photographing everything or taking videos and stuff. That's just me. I'm that person in a group that will take pictures and videos and stories and I, because I want to look back on these and when I post a lot of stories on Instagram, and I'm sorry, I'm going so off tangent with this. I do it for me. I want to look back at my day and it's like, damn, that was fucking sick. That was fun. That was a fun moment. This and that. I love that. That's just me. But now going back to the movie. So after that gig, Tad gives up his portion of, I guess, like the finder's fee. So that way the band can actually get paid. They only get like six bucks and some change a piece after they split everything. And so the band is very much upset because they came so far only for six bucks and change until he tells them, hey, I can make up for it. I can call my cousin Daniel and I can get you guys a gig. I can get you guys a for sure gig. And so they decide to trust him one more time because they they're struggling like they've had to siphon gas to where they can get to where they need to go. And they were talking about how far they can go and then they have to siphon more just to go back home. So they get all packed up, set up, and he sends them on the road. They know exactly where they're going to go. But he gives them a warning. There are going to be some skins in the crowd, so, you know, don't talk politics. Maybe play some of your older stuff, your heavier stuff. And that's when the band's asking questions like, oh, are they going to be, like, burning crosses or anything? Or, like, like, you know, what's the deal? Like, there's always skinheads at a punk show. And, unfortunately, that's... I, I believe it. That's kind of like a staple or a stereotype or a stigma or something. One of those things that starts with the S. I'm not trying to do alliteration right now. Where you will see like these people at these shows. Have I ever come across one? No. Honestly, I'm not going to lie. I'm not a very violent person. But if I were to see a neo-Nazi in the crowd somewhere, I'm, I'm going to hit, bro. I'll wait for the pit. I'm not going to lie. I'll play a little bit like a bitch because one, I don't want to fucking go to jail or anything. But it's also like, I'm a punch a fucking Nazi. If I could say in my lifetime, yo, I punched a fucking Nazi. I'm in. I don't care if I break my hand or anything. Like, like look at my wrists. My wrists are like small, but I would love to punch a fucking Nazi. Anybody who's gotten to do that, my hat's off to you, man. Like fucking respect. All right. No room for fucking Nazis in the world, bro. Not neo, not traditional or any other shit or white supremacist bullshit should be allowed fuck all that noise bro then they ask if he's gonna be there he turns around and says no i gotta get the place ready vacuum up clean up and shit because him and his girl are gonna be staying that's an important little detail that's gonna come in handy in just a few minutes and it's gonna be a bigger piece to the overarching story fast forward a little bit and now the group goes and meets up with cousin daniel played by mark weber who i actually know from 13 sins and scott pilgrim so this guy is definitely used to being a punk and dealing with some pretty fucked up shit. Now, whenever Tiger meets Daniel, he brings up how Tad is just getting his place ready for Daniel and his girl. And immediately Daniel just like kind of chokes him a little bit and tells him, just don't fucking mention it. Not me, not her, not him. None of it is safer that way and all that stuff. So immediately you're like, okay, what the fuck is that about? Like, that's a different little subplot right there. What's going on with that? And in case anybody doesn't know what the green room is, the green room is kind of the room the bands hang out in before the show starts. You know, it's where they keep their stuff, like personal items. They hang out, eat lunch and all that other stuff. It's just, it's kind of like their break room. 
But you go in there and the walls are just plastered with stickers and graffiti of obscenities, slurs, all that. You get the gist exactly what type of place this is. And there's even a southern flag in there. And, and I think that's a good representation as well. The southern flag is another fucking thing I don't fully understand. It's just the mentality of people supporting that. I grew up in southern Georgia, so I saw that shit all the time. And the older I've gotten, and of course learning about that in history, I'm just like, why do we care? And I don't believe that whole southern heritage thing. Like, I mean, I, I would say I'm kind of proud to be from the south, but I'm not fucking proud to be from the south and holding the goddamn flag. Is it just me to think it's treasonous? Like, I don't know. That's just me. It, there were obvious, There was a war about this. They lost. I would, I would assume it's treasonous to have the flag or support that flag or anything like that because you're kind of going against the nearly unanimous vibe of no slaves and none of that other shit. Like, we're all just like one country. You know, it could just be me. I may be too dumb. I don't get it. I don't really care because usually if you're on that side, you're pretty much not exactly a good person. And I know there's morally gray areas and, and I do believe nobody is just 100% bad, 100% good. It, it's all over, over the place. But that's one of those things I'm just like, okay, it's literally a red flag. Like, I, I don't know how else to put it. It's a fucking red flag. I don't know. But thankfully, not all Southern people are like that. I accept each and every one of you. All open arms. Just don't be a fucking dick and try to hurt anybody. And just let people be. But while looking around and seeing all that, Pat, Anton Yelchin's character, says he has a great idea. And then we cut to them being on stage, getting ready to play. And he looks very nervous because you just see this crowd of just like skinheads and, and he's having second thoughts and Sam pokes fun at him saying, if you back out right now, I'm going to tell them you're Jewish, which is one hilarious. I think that's a great dark joke Two, That's very fucked up, dude. Like, God, I would. Oh, man, I would be scared shitless if somebody were to threaten me with that. But then again, they do something else that is incredibly ballsy that I think if anybody's ever done this. Fucking good on you, man. That is awesome. But they start playing Nazi punks fuck off by the Dead Kennedys as their opening track. And obviously gets the crowd fucking heated, bro. They, they, they automatically just look all pissed off. They're getting closer to the stage. They're not rocking out or anything. Some of them are even throwing beers and like flipping birds and talking shit. Like that's ballsy as shit. That is fucking punk right there. Like they're, they're like the word punk gets extremely muddled, but that is clear as day. Fucking punk right there to a T blood, sweat, tears, every bit of that all punk. And, I, and that's a scene I didn't know I would ever need, but I'm so glad green room gives me a scene like that because that's fucking phenomenal, man. Chef's kiss. And while they're playing that song, Anton, I think he's just more of the paranoid end. So he's looking at like everyone and he notices a small group of people making their way towards, I guess, the same hallway that takes them to the green room. That is actually the headliners cow catcher. So it's like two guys, two girls. And these two girls, they kind of fall behind a little bit and they start whispering to each other in the crowd. And Gabe, who's kind of one of the head neo-Nazis. I don't know if he's the guy kind of like running the venue a little bit, maybe a manager of some sort, but he sees them talking. So he's like staring them down. Anton's looking at him. Pat's looking at him, looking at the girls. And it's like all kind of weird. The movie's clearly pointing out these specific people. So Cowcatcher goes to the back. They're not seen for a little bit. Once that song ends, they decide to play another song. This is one of their originals. And they actually win over the crowd. And the music fades out in this scene and it's scored beautifully and it's all shot in slow-mo you see all these punks just moshing dancing all this other stuff singing along or probably not singing along because it's a brand new song to them but they're enjoying the show and it looks so cool i i like how this scene was shot to where it looks like such a beautiful and awesome thing to just be a part of. Usually this type of thing, like moshing and all that stuff, is it's always shown in such a light that, oh, it's dangerous. Bad people go there and all that other stuff. Like, no, no, people just go and have fun. Like, I've been moshing, but I'm not going to fucking go out of my way and hurt people or anything like that. I try not to. You know, the things I don't believe in are fucking crowd killing which is where somebody goes in, they just start swinging, like punching, kicking, like they purposely 
do all those things when they get in a group of people and there's some other stuff i think it's all bullshit i don't care what anybody says or, oh you you've never been to a real rock show or whatever doesn't fucking matter there is a time and a place if there's a big mosh pit somebody goes in there's a good chance you're gonna get hit that's the gamble you're taking you know that when you go in there now the people along the sides and other people ran parts of the crowd they don't fuck with that if they didn't get in they didn't get in don't go out of your way to harm those people don't be a fucking douchebag that's not how it's supposed to go. You want people to enjoy these shows. You want to enjoy it your own way. There's people that are going to be doing exactly what you're doing. They want to enjoy it another way. Those people are going to be with people that want to do exactly what they're doing. The only one I kind of let slide is crowd surfing because, I mean, hey, it's crowd surfing. It's not really supposed to be dangerous. The only thing is try to have a bit of common sense and some etiquette. Hey, especially especially these two groups right here I'm about to talk about when it comes to concert etiquette. The chicks who go to shows wearing these big ass fucking boots. Don't kick your feet in shit when you are crowd surfing, okay? These people are supposed to help you. And if you are just fucking up these people, they're supposed to help you. And a lot of times it's like feet first you're coming. These people that are right here that you're coming to and you're kicking your feet, probably kicking them and all that stuff. Those people could just move the fuck out of the way and drop your ass. And trust me, it will fucking hurt. It is concrete. And if nobody wants to catch you, nobody's going to fucking catch you, my guy. You weigh a lot more than you think. And I'm not trying to fat shame or nothing, but you weigh a lot more than you think. Just because a crowd of people can hold you, all it takes is a few of them to be like, no, nope, fuck that move out the way and your ass is fucking going down you're gonna eat shit but now this next part is gonna kind of come off as fat shaming there's always some big dudes that honestly man you should not be crowd surfing or at least please pay attention to the area that you're about to start crowd surfing because look at me look at me like you see this you see this you think i can fucking hold you up my guy I don't want you to get a fucking concussion or anything either or break a hip or something. I don't want you to do any of that, but shit, if you're coming on top of me, bro, I'm moving. I do not want to get crushed. And it's happened before where I'm trying, like, I'm bending, trying to fucking hold somebody up. It is not fun. It sucks. It hurts. Fuck, please. Just be careful. Just for my sake and your sake. That's all it is. It's like, yo, think twice a little bit. Be ready to land on your feet. Especially now more chicks are starting to go to these types of shows and I'm not trying to say anything bad about women But a lot of them don't really have that concert know-how and common courtesy A lot of them are gonna move the fuck out of the way and There's just gonna be less people there to catch you and and I'm sorry dog if it comes down to me or you I'm moving out of the way. I'm gonna worry about me, but I'm gonna hope you're okay Like I'll help you up if I can But yeah, that's like another thing just those two groups chicks with the big boots fucking doc martens and platforms and shit you guys suck man but i hope you have fun but god damn please don't kick your legs or anything if you have to crisscross that shit just crowd surf all right that's all you got to do all right that's it only kicking all that other shit if somebody's like taking advantage of the moment that a chick's climbing over them which does happen if you do that you're a big fucking piece of shit that's why i don't even like grab or anything i try to like fists or like sh like elbows and stuff like i try to hold up in different ways or if i can which a lot of times what i'm doing i'm grabbing fucking boots and ankles and like all right there you go don't fucking kick me because honestly i'm gonna want to throw a punch but i mean of course i'm not going to i'm sorry i keep going off tangent but yeah so that's just one of those things i think it's beautiful they represented that in such a cool way that's awesome and i think that's done very well by somebody who understands the scene. But now after they get done with their set, they head back to the green room. So obviously they didn't get killed or anything. So I assume they had a really good time. The people probably loved it. Obviously didn't like that first song, but not enough to just go ahead and kill them as they get off stage. So they go back and they see all their stuff is in the hallway. And the guy, his name is Big Justin. I don't know if he's like a bodyguard or something. He, he's just really big like neo-Nazi dude. And he tells them, hey, yeah, so we had to make room for the headliners. We moved your stuff out here so we could just pack up your stuff, pay you out, and you guys can go. 
And they're all for it. They're like, cool. They start grabbing their stuff. But then Sam realizes she left her phone in the green room. And Pat's like, you know, hey, I'll go grab it real quick. So he goes in there pretty quick. Doesn't make eye contact with anybody. Goes in, grabs the phone, turns around. And it's like, hey, guys. And then that's when he notices the band Cowcatcher is standing around this body. There is this chick with a knife in her like temple, in her head, just dead on the ground. And Amber, who was kind of the final girl of this movie, I would say, that's going to go ahead and be a spoiler. She's kind of the final girl. And she is played by Emojin Pood. I hope I'm saying that right. I have no idea how to pronounce her name. But she's also from the 2011 Fright Night remake and 28 weeks later. And so she asked Pat, can he call the police? And she's obviously crying because that's her friend that's like dead. And so Pat starts to freak out. So Pat actually calls them and he's trying to tell them like, oh, okay, I don't really know where we are. Like he's scatterbrained right now. And this is where Gabe comes back and he snatches away the phone while Pat's trying to make his way down the hallway, hangs up the phone with the cops and tells everybody, all right, relax. We're going to figure this out. Hold on. Like, you know, like calm down. And this is where it gets pretty insane because I, I was so lost in what was happening here. So when the cops call back, he tells them like, yeah, you know, we got disconnected. I, I was trying to report a stabbing. So the cops are going to be coming. He already told them about the stabbing, which is the girl on the floor. So it's like, okay, why is this guy reporting what just happened? You know, what's going on? So he comes back with a gun. And he's brandishing it around a little bit, but he's not being like, oh, like, get the fuck in, like, all this other stuff. He's not being super aggressive. So, obviously, he's not a very violent person. He's just trying to do his job and contain the situation. So, he tells them they all need to go back in the, into the green room. And he's holding the gun. It's like, hey, I have it. Like, he points it around a little bit, but he's mainly just, like, holding it, like, go. Like, get in there. Cops are coming. We're going to figure it out. Everybody stay calm. Stay in here. So Gabe goes out to, I guess, the box office person or the financer, tells him, hey, I need $600. And we still don't really know what's going on. Like, like okay, how, like, what's happening? What's unfolding right now? And I love that. I love, we don't really know what's going on. I couldn't have guessed what the fuck is happening. So he tells him, I need $600. Somebody's dead. And the guy said, okay, what else do you need? And Gabe says, a true believer. And the finance guy goes like, all right. How about two? And I know I've went off tangent a little bit, but all these things up until this point, until I'm telling you right now, happens within the first 20 minutes of the film. You still have over an hour left of just shit that's going to go wrong. And now the true believers that that finance dude was talking about, and this is where we get an idea of what's happening. And he pays one of them to get stabbed. So one twin stabs the other twin like twice, like a full on Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker moment. Cops come. They talk to them, pretty much going to take them away. That is the stabbing that was reported. The stabbing, air quotes, that was reported. So the cops take them, leave. Now, the rest of the Cowcatcher members were actually able to leave, except Amber, who was the only chick left from the group. Darcy allowed the other ones to go, which is Sir Patrick Stewart's character. Now, there is a lot of back and forth. There is a lot of talking in this movie because it is very intense and a lot of it's through the door. I'm not going to go through all that. But eventually, our protagonists get the best of Big Justin because he was left in charge of the group. He had a gun, so they got it away from him. So they barricaded themselves inside this room. But Darcy arrives on the scene and he tells him, hey, he just wants the guns gone. Cops have already left and gone. We just want you guys out. We don't want any other hard feelings. But obviously, you could tell he's definitely lying about that because... Yeah, it's fucking scary. What, what would anybody want to do, you know? And so he starts telling them, hey, I just want the guns out of the scenario. But if you guys won't play along and just get out of here, the only thing I could say is you guys are on my property, a band from out of town that we don't know. You guys have a gun that's unregistered and there is a dead body and you have a hostage. I'm well within my right to protect myself. And so they start to realize, oh, fuck, he's kind of right. They're going to pin this all on us, blah, 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 blah. So he just says, I want the gun out of the way. You guys can stay out of the room. I just want the gun out. So Pat is the one with the gun. And he tells him, all right, you know, I'll hand the gun out to you. I'm going to throw it. And so while they're slowly opening the door, there's this little vent at the bottom of the door that got kicked in during a scuffle. And Amber is looking through it and she can see Darcy's feet. He's standing by the wall, you know, across the door. Good space. But while the door is opening, and I love this. I, I just love how this was shot. It looks great. Pretty much angled ground level. Like, you, like you're crouched. The camera is crouched. And you see what she sees. And so the door is opening a little bit towards her. And once it opens, you see the boots with the red laces. Somebody hiding off to the side next to the wall. So she tries to warn them real quick. 
they grab his hand and you just hear Pat just screaming and they're, and everyone else is trying to grab him and like pull him back into the room. And you just hear him just fucking blood curling screams, just like just going. And so whenever they finally pull him back in, you see his left arm is cut to shit. It is like his wrist is like super cut right here. Like his hand is like dangling. He has other deep lacerations. The moment you see that, you know what type of movie you're in for. And you know damn well these people aren't going to fucking make it out alive. And everyone's like freaking out. They're trying to keep their composure. But I mean, it's hard. You got a dead chick there. You got this guy all caught up. There's there's nothing. They have a hostage. So you don't really know what the hell to do. It's fucking so much. It's so intense. And so now everybody goes their separate ways. They're stuck in there. They have no gun. They have no weapons. And then everyone else is outside. They got the gun. They got it out of the way. That's what they wanted. They didn't want gunshots or any of that. And you start to see why. Because they start walking around. They're planning everything. Darcy, Sir Patrick Stewart's character, is walking around giving orders. Like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to call these people. We're going to get everybody out of here. We're only going to keep red laces. We need to know who's all here. Who knows they're here. And stuff. So they start going through all their stuff in the van. They're trying to plan this out accordingly. And after getting rid of everyone, only just nothing but neo-Nazis are left there. And while this whole thing is going on with him cutting up his arm and stuff, another, like back to back, another very gruesome and fucking disturbing moment happens. And, and I know I say that and it doesn't feel like it, but it's the environment, like just the atmosphere of what's happening and how real it looks and just how everybody has all these emotions and stuff it comes off extremely visceral they do an incredible job of this because i know there's way more graphic things you can see in other horror movies and stuff like that but this is different it hits so different because i believe it just it looks way more real you believe these things are happening and it's because you can't really separate like, oh, this would happen. No, this type of shit probably does happen and would happen and most likely has happened. And so they have Big Justin. Reese has him in a headlock. And I feel like at this point, he's just going to choke him to death because they don't know what to do. They're in a life or death situation. People are out there. They got one dude here. Something's got to happen, you know. And so Sam starts asking like, yo, well, like, when, when do you know like he's out? Like, like that it's it, that it's it, that it's done. And Amber with a box cutter that big Justin had that they got from him earlier from him cleaning out his pockets. She just walks up and I feel like this girl is just so traumatized. Now she's just like numb, like the rest of the movie. So she walks up, fucking extends the blade, digs it. Like, I, I don't know what you would call this section, but kind of like right under your stomach, probably before like your waistline, pr probably there waistline. She just like sticks it there and just starts cutting up. And it's just splitting open and you just start to see blood and like you see the fat and stuff An incredible practical effect. Very, very well done. It is so fucking gruesome looking. It's disgusting, dude. It's so gross. Like I I've seen a lot of fucked up shit on Twitter. Like I've seen so many death videos and all these other things. I grew up on the internet. I've seen a lot. Okay. I like, that type of stuff just doesn't really phase me much anymore. I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of broken in that way, I guess. And seeing that in the movie, I was like, wow, that is that is real looking because I know what the real stuff looks like. And I'm like, wow, OK, like, dude, shit. Like, you know, you have that sense of like disbelief whenever you do watch movies because you can believe like, oh, yeah, what I'm watching. Like you're into the movie. So like, no, you're not saying you think it's real, but it's really happening, you know, like it's believable. And this is a hundred percent believable. I was just like, dude, what the fuck? He's very much fucking dead. And that's when they know, man, we got to get the fuck out of here. Like shit's going south. Like people are dead. Like we have to go. They did see light coming from somewhere underneath. And now they actually decide to break down into that little floor panel. And whenever they go down there, they see exactly why they don't want anything else happening there they didn't want to report the death or nothing it's because they have a full-on meth lab downstairs they want nobody to know about so they want all this shit to happen off property that's why they want the cops around and they hired that diversion 
and then now it's like okay we don't want guns like we, we, we don't want draw attention nothing we just want to get you guys out and of course they want to kill them so that's why and i love this excuse for like buying the time of using guns i think guns make movies so boring and green room does a good job of trying to separate that because it takes a while before you hear a gunshot go off anywhere i don't even know how long into the movie but it takes a minute you see guns but they they're not fucking scary i don't think they're scary i mean of course in real life guns are fucking scary but i don't think they're scary now in, in movies because they make everything so boring but now everybody's using blades using knives and it's gruesome because you get to see two back-to-back -back horrific incidences happen and it's like oh my god three major things happened with a knife you got somebody who was stabbed in the head you got somebody just gutted and you have somebody like to completely cut up their arm where they can't even use it much anymore for the rest of the movie it's insane they made blades scary everybody knows they're scary but they made them scarier in this movie and it's so well done so after all that happens they know they need to get out and reese is just tired of it he, he's like you know what fuck it i just want to get out we may live we may die but maybe not all of us so I think we just fucking make a run for it. So they kind of get together some makeshift things to where they can use his weapons to where they can go. And right before they're going to get out, and I like this moment because earlier they were doing this interview with Tad at his house. And he asked them about their Desert Island bands or artists or whatever. And they all gave like pretty punk answers, you know, like Misfits and um, Black Sabbath and like some other stuff. But now right before they're gonna die and you see like them for what they really are you see that their answers actually changed one of them was saying prince somebody else said madonna so like their answers are like mainstream and they changed and they're not really ashamed of it they just think it's funny and they laugh about it right before they're about to rush out to their possible death because all these nazis are just hanging out outside i think this goes to show because you obviously see these people are fucking punk, but they like people like Madonna and Prince. Like, it doesn't matter. They're into that. They're not gatekeeping. They're not being fucking posers or anything like that. I mean, probably to an extent, but you know, these people are legit, but around themselves, when it counts, they're like, yeah, no, I'm into these things. Like, this is what it would be. And I think that's so cool because, dude, fuck people who gatekeep and just... Gatekeeping and posers got posers is super like wishy washy, but gatekeeping, you're a fucking douche, man. I understand gatekeeping over the last couple of years. I've seen how like the bands I like have gotten extremely popular and how hard it is and how expensive it's gotten. Like for me to go to Bad Omens, my girlfriend and I have seen Bad Omens twice and we had to go out of our way for these things to happen because of how popular they've gotten. And I'm so happy. I'm proud of their success. They fucking deserve it. Same with them, Bring Me the Horizon, but man. And just like other bands that we're really, really into, it has gotten way more expensive and so hard to go to these shows now because you got people who don't know anything about concert etiquette at all. They're new to the scene. They don't give a fuck. And sometimes it's downright just disrespectful because it's like, at least try to be considerate. And these people don't know how to be considerate. And I'm not saying just the newbies. No, some people come in, they're really cool. We've met cool new people at shows. And that's awesome. You know, we love that. We encourage that. I want that to be a thing. I want them to feel comfortable, safe, happy in the environment. Because that's what I had when I was younger getting into the scene. We need that. We need that hand that inviting hand it's like come on yeah have fun you know like fuck around it's gotten so hard and it makes it super difficult and i don't want to gatekeep or anything anybody who gatekeeps or anything like that i think is a fucking poser you suck you should want your people to succeed you should want more people to be into the shit you're into because dude i grew up in the day where liking all of these things and dressing the way i do and all this other stuff people hated me people bullied the fuck out of me i got called so many things like just needlessly bullied when i wouldn't fuck with anybody you know my social skills were so bad back then like i wouldn't have imagined myself having a podcast or tiktok or anything like that so like yeah i want more people to feel comfortable I was like no yeah man it's cool like the shit i like is cool i'm glad other people see oh yeah that shit's actually really fucking cool now like fuck yeah yeah dude 
fuck yeah and yeah some people can be very annoying about it but to the point of poser it's like i don't know i think we changed poser to the pick me now and i think pick me is way more shameful poser i don't know like i said it's wishy-washy because i don't know what you're into i don't know your life story but i think we can all identify a pick me that's a bit different i'm not trying to be super judgy but it's super hard because of people's intentions you never really know but sometimes you can pick up on what people's intentions are and stuff but it, it just sucks don't be a fucking gatekeeping asshole i've met people like that who think they're all hot shit especially people who are into horror punk any type of metal music or just body mods alternative like ah oh, dude i've met some of the biggest douchebags ever and it's like just just stop man just let people live how they want to live whatever don't belittle somebody else or try to gatekeep somebody else or say people are copying you or any of this other shit like trying to create like imposter syndrome or whatever the fuck calm the fuck down just enjoy it don't be a douche and if you're new to things enjoy the stuff i hope you find the right people that let you enjoy these things don't be insufferable about it either coming in where you're just being like just disrespectful or you know anything like this i know come in good energy i shouldn't have to like spoon feed what i mean it's like you would know of like okay yeah like don't be a dick about it you know don't be disrespectful or like automatically hate the older people or something like that who've been in the scene longer or try to be like oh i'm a bigger i'm a bigger fan than you and it's like okay hold on like the fuck like, like don't do that we're not trying to be around brandishing a oh yeah i've been in this scene way longer than you I don't think anybody's really trying to do that. I'm sure some people would be like, oh yeah, that's cool. You got to be here back in this day. You were in this time. That's awesome. You know, I got people jealous of like the time frame that I was able to do things and stuff. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's insane. Like, you know, it was cool. Like I'm, I'm lucky I got to be in that. It sucks you can't. But then you, if you got people to just come in and just try to like, just belittle like your experiences and stuff. And it's like, wait, hold on. Like, the fuck like you're new here like, like relax why are you coming at me you know like we could share experiences and it's not going to be a big deal i'm not going to judge yours but if you're automatically judging mine it's like you're a douche you know it either end new old doesn't matter just have fun that's it sorry going off tangent one more time so now we're back into the movie now they finally go outside and they realize nobody's around it's quiet no neo-nazis nothing they just walk out they're all walking together they have their weapons like okay what's going on and the only thing you hear is somebody coming in and there's a dog and it's just a pit bull and hey pit bulls aren't bad i understand why they're scary but they're not bad people are bad that train them they let the dog loose and it kills tiger it just completely rips his throat it's going at him while tiger's getting killed by the dog you see reese bust through a kitchen trying to find a way out he finds this window and he's able to get out but as soon as he's coming out like like this is all happening in the span of a minute of them just coming out the door and as soon as he's like tumbling out he's already getting like hit with like this little axe or something so like they're already waiting there they're waiting at all the exits they start axing him just start cutting him up and it's just like damn and he's just left to kind of bleed out for the rest of the time and the feedback that's going from like the mic to the amp scares the dog away and the only people left is Sam, Amber, and Pat. So they decide, you know what? Fuck it. Like, we, we failed. We have to go back. So they go back into the green room. And it's just them trying to recuperate. This is where we start. Now, this is where we start to develop some other stuff. And that minor plot point from earlier starts to come back. So while the neo-Nazis are outside, they're all talking about how many died and blah, 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 blah. And the person that's been trying to figure out everything because he still doesn't know what's going on is Mark Webber's character, Daniel. He doesn't know what's happening, but he's been skittish this whole time and trying to figure out what's going on. Because while all that was happening, he was waiting outside in the car like way earlier. So he was waiting on something. Don't really know what, but I think now we can kind of piece things together. Gabe was kind of keeping him in the dark for a reason, and it's because he kind of knew. But he told him that Emily, which is the other chick from the cow catcher band that was killed, the one that got knifed in the head, said that she got killed. We don't know what's going on, but it was them in there. He doesn't tell him it was Worm, that she died, and now they're trying to like kill these guys that are in there. So he's like, all right, you know what? Let me go in. Let me get this guy, and, and we'll go in and kill him. They charge the room, they get in there, and Daniel sees Amber, it's like, okay, which one did it? And she tells him it was Worm. Like, if you really want to know, he's like, bullshit, which one did it? And she's like, well, okay, so obviously you know nothing about what's really going on. So they start talking, and the other neo-Nazi there is just like, 
we're gonna fucking kill him like what are we doing like what's going on like he doesn't know what to do and this is where it unfolds Amber tells Daniel, Worm found out that Emily was going to leave, but he didn't know it was going to be with you. Like the catalyst of all that happening, her murder was because she was going to run away with this guy. So they're, they're just like two lovebirds that they were just going to run away and be together. They were going to leave the scene. And it was going to happen during a set during a certain song. It was going to be their cue to leave, but obviously she got murdered before that, which really sucks. There was actually more to it than that. Sir Patrick Stewart's character, Darcy, he has the keys and he goes through Daniel's trunk because Gabe told him how he didn't have Daniel in a certain position because he wasn't really sure about him because he had suspicions about Emily and him. And obviously Emily being the one that died, Darcy being kind of smart, went and checked the car and saw, oh yeah, they had their stuff packed. They were going to run away. But then he sees it was something else. There is a piece of evidence, a bat, that still had blood on it. It was wrapped in plastic. Darcy goes over to Gabe and is like, you remember this? Like, this was supposed to be gone. This is from, like, the last, like, like I think he said boot meeting or something like that. So, obviously, they, they went on a massacre or something. They did something with this bat. He's like, this was supposed to be gone. And Worm just saved everyone by killing Emily. And now... Daniel is inside with them, so now they just need to go and kill all of them. So he was going to turn on the whole group and everything, and these people were going to run away and try to live a happy life. Darcy wasn't going to let that happen. And now Daniel told the other neo-Nazi, all right, you got to go. Like, just, you might as well just go outside. So he's confused, and he's like, all right, because, I mean, he's kind of outnumbered. So he just leaves. Daniel fully swapped sides, and now he's like, look, I'm going to help you guys get out of here. I know where a gun is. We're going to go outside to the bar. There's a shotgun underneath it. So they go out there one more time. And he's like, okay, I'm going to get it. And this is where guns become scary. As soon as he grabs the shotgun and starts loading it right there at the bar, split second later, shotgun blast to the face by another dude that was in the building. Fucking wild. Just out of nowhere. You thought this guy was going to be like this fucking hero that comes in and helps the people? No. Boom. Swap sides, immediately shot in the fucking face. Very good practical effects, too. And Sam sprays the guy that had the shotgun with a firing steam washer, and Pat just comes up with a machete and just one to the neck. Just, like, just slit it. That dude's dead. So now they got two shotguns. So it's like, cool. Very, very little bullets. They decide, you know what? We're just going to go outside, do what we can. They go out there. Everyone just kind of says, fuck it at this point with the bullets. They're not even trying to too hard to cover up anything so they just go outside just barrage of bullets and then sam gets eaten by the dog comes up just starts going at her the other two just retreat inside now it's just them two left and now a lot of the neo-nazis leave the rest go off to set up this whole situation where it comes off as self-defense and trespassing and so on so these other two neo-nazis they go into the building they're there to hunt them but they have this plan and i think it's really cool they shave pat's head and dress him up like a Nazi. And so he's acting like he's chasing Amber. And they're just confused. Like, oh, like, who the fuck is that guy? Like, what the hell? So they follow him. And one of them follows him down into the heroin place. But doesn't follow him all the way. Because he doesn't know what's going on. He's kind of scared. So the other guy is at the top waiting. The other dude just gets his throat slit by Amber. Because she crawls out of a couch. And that dude is just terrified. He's like, great. There's one up there with a gun. And a box cutter. There's another one down here with a machete. So he's like super lost, super scared, and he eventually, he gets got too. So now they're kind of fully weaponed out, and they try to make their way out. And they come across Gabe, who is already pressure washing everything, and, and he knows he's caught. He's like, damn. All right. And he just says, look, I just, I don't want to go to jail and stuff. So he kind of cowardously, in a way, he like flips sides. So he leads the way in the woods uh, to where they're going. And he just tells them, hey, look, like, I'll go find somewhere. I'll call the cops. And they're just like, okay, like, yeah, like, you better. And he says, no, I promise. Like, he, you could tell he w wasn't a very violent person or anything. So I, I don't know what exactly his deal was. He was not really into anything. He didn't like how anything went down. He didn't really hurt anybody. He's not trying to. But then they go find Darcy and these two other neo-Nazis. And they see what's happening. They're like, wow, you guys really going to pin it all on us? And he's like, yep, well, you know, shit happens. They gun down the other two, and it's just Darcy left. And Darcy's just like, well, 
fuck this. So he just turns away in a very weird thing I didn't expect. He just turns away and he has a gun and he's trying to like just like speed walk away because I mean, he is an old dude. And then he turns and tries to shoot and they fucking gun him down, man. And it's just like, wow, like what the fuck? They actually went out of their way to just go kill him. It was mainly Amber that wanted to kill him. She's like, I thought that's why we walked up here was to kill him. You know, it's like, well, I mean, yeah, like, fuck it. They killed all your friends and shit. They gave you one of the worst nights of your life imaginable. It's now morning. They stayed up all night for this shit. And the movie ends in this very particular way. And I love it. The dog that killed Tiger ran away earlier. So he's been walking the street this whole time. You get little nods to not forget about the dog. Cause you'll see a scene where like a second, just like walking down the road and you'll see like a zoom in of like a beware dog sign. So obviously it's like a Chekhov's gun kind of moment, which if you don't know what a Chekhov's gun is, this is where something is introduced or alluded to very specifically in the beginning. And you know, it's going to come in at another point later. So that's what's going on while all this is happening, the escapes and deaths and stuff. This dog is just loose. That's been killing people loose without a trainer and just walking, going back to its owner. So after they get done killing everyone, it's just them two and they're relaxing like, wow, like the night's over. And then you see the dog, like you hear the chain dragging on the concrete and then you see the dog just coming towards them. And even they're paranoid, like, oh shit, because it's two very injured people and all they got is guns. So they, they point at it. They start pulling the triggers, but they're empty. So nothing's happening. And the dog is so unfazed, just walking by them. And they're just staring at it like, the fuck? And it goes up to the owner, which the owner is already dead because they killed him. It just lays on his arm. And I like to think of that as they were having a moment to say, because throughout the movie, that anytime they've used the dogs, they've been evil and just killing people and just used as weapons. And they even said they're fighting dogs. So they were made to do these things. And I like how it ends here because I interpret it as dogs are not evil. People make them do bad things. So like this pit bull, it's a very menacing looking dog. A lot of people are scared of pit bulls because of, you know, their demeanor and how they look and stuff. Yeah, it can be a bit scary, but no, they're they're good dogs. If you're just good to them, they can be very loving. And so that's all it was. It didn't try to harm them or anything. It just walked right by and just laid by its dead owner, which is very fucking sad. But I think it's a good note when it could have killed those people because they're already bloody and weak and can't defend themselves. It could have easily killed both of them. But they really wanted to let you know, hey, at the end of this movie, uh, -uh dogs aren't bad. Neo-Nazis are bad. People are bad. The dog's not bad. The dog's chill and it's just doing what it's told and it's not going to hurt anybody on its own unless it's made to. And I love that little message right there. That is perfect. Some people don't fucking deserve dogs, man. So yeah, that is Green Room. It is gnarly. Man, I just wanted to talk about it. And of course, I add my own things into it. That's why I like. I like to talk about movies, my interpretations, things I like about them. And maybe a personal story or going off tangent multiple times like I normally do. Because it is podcast. I want you guys to, I don't know. We get to know each other a little bit every episode other than me just talking movies, you know? I'm very sorry it took so long to get to another episode. Please understand. But I am trying, trying to change careers, work on projects. So much happening, but I will try to keep doing them. I like doing them. They're fun. So I really hope you guys enjoy it. Please show some love, share, like, subscribe. But before we go off, I'm going to give you guys a cookies fortune, man. You already know how it is. And I got one for you, and here we go. The art of life is not controlling what happened to us, but using what happens to us. Do with that what you will, ladies and gentlemen. And until next time, be excellent, be kind, subscribe to the channel.